Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel and welcome to my first reading wrap-up of 2024. January was a really good reading month for me. I didn't do the best job at sticking to my TBR that I set, but I'm not even mad about it because I loved almost every single book that I read and I gave four stars or higher to almost every single book that I read. So I can't wait to talk about all these books with you guys today. Let's just jump right in. Starting with the first book I picked up this year, which is Behind the Net by Stephanie Archer. This one is on Kindle Unlimited, so I read it on my Kindle. I feel like I've just been seeing this cover everywhere and I was drawn to it so I decided to pick it up. It is a hockey romance between our NHL goalie Jamie and his assistant he hires named Pippa. They actually both went to high school together and definitely know of one another but they think that the other person doesn't remember them at all and has no clue who they are so they just aren't saying anything and pretending to be strangers. They're also hiding from each other the fact that they both are starting to get feelings for the other person. Jamie is hiding his feelings the best way he knows how which is to keep his distance and avoid Pippa. It's definitely a grumpy sunshine romance because in doing this Jamie comes off as very grumpy and Pippa is our sunshiny girl. When we're in her head she's very much like why does he hate me? What am I doing wrong? And just trying to be the best assistant possible. Even though when you're in Jamie's head you know he doesn't hate her. He's just trying to keep his distance so he doesn't freak Pippa out. And I thought this book was so cute. I gave it four stars. It was so easy to read. The writing was just so digestible and bingeable and I flew through it. I had the best time. It was such a fun book to read and so enjoyable. The chemistry between Pippa and Jamie was so good. I was really rooting for them to get together. The buildup and the tension between them was so good and the story was so well paced. I think the only thing I didn't love about this book is that Jamie had this nickname for Pippa and the nickname itself didn't bother me. It was just how much he called her the nickname and nothing else. By the end I was so annoyed of it and it felt so overused. I was like, please call her by her first name a few times. I would have been fine with him calling her babe because I was just so over the nickname, but that was the only thing I didn't love about it. It wasn't my perfect romance, but it was very enjoyable and a very fun time and I would highly recommend it. This is also the start to a series, which I wasn't even planning to read book two in January. I was gonna wait a bit, but I was just so excited to read about the characters that book two follows that I ended up picking it up later in the month and book two is The Fake Out. This one follows Pippa's sister Hazel and then our hockey player in this is Rory. Rory and Jamie used to be good friends but they had a falling out and now Rory is getting traded to play for the same hockey team as Jamie. Hazel actually works for the hockey team as a physiotherapist and it becomes a fake dating trope because Hazel's ex also gets traded to play for the same hockey team and she gets assigned to be his physiotherapist. So she's kind of trying to show that she has moved on and is doing better and is over her ex because they had a really bad break up. Rory is perfectly fine to fake date Hazel because he's always had a thing for her. He wishes they were really dating and you kind of see their romance turn from fake to real. It was super cute. I liked this one even more than Behind the Net by just a little bit. I ended up giving this one 4.25 stars. I love the characters in this book I think even more than in Behind the Net and I just love the couple together so much. One thing I loved in both of these books is that the couple has both an emotional connection and a physical connection which is something I definitely need need in my romance books. I need the couple to have both for me to really get behind them and really root for them and I thought it was done so well in both of these books. I loved it and I'm so excited for book three to come out. There hasn't been an announcement on the date or anything yet but the end of book two really sets up the characters and the story for book three so I'm just so excited to read more. I highly recommend this series. I feel like if you liked the deal you would like Behind the Net. It kind of reminded me a bit of the deal in some ways. Just the ways the characters kind of help each other through their struggles and then the fake out reminded me a lot of the right move just kind of the way that the fake dating trope came about super fun super enjoyable I think if you're in a slump these would be perfect to get you out of it because they were just so easy to read and fly through and such a great time then I ended up picking up the midnight library by Matt Haig this is one of those OG book talk books that I feel like I'm one of the last people to read I knew I wanted to read this at the start of a new year just based on what I knew the message and the theme of the book to be about I always like to read those kind of books at the start of a new year when I'm trying to start over fresh, make new goals and resolutions and really reflect on things in my life and this book was perfect for that. The subject matter in this book is very heavy so definitely check content warnings if you're considering picking this one up but in this book we follow Nora who is contemplating ending her life. She ends up getting transported to this magical library called the Midnight Library where each book in the library shows what her life would have looked like if she had made a slightly different decision and she gets to try 
try out different life paths for herself. And I thought this book was great. I gave it four and a half stars. The concept really spoke to me because it's something that I think about all the time. I feel like I'm so indecisive because I always have that what if feeling. What if I would have done that one thing differently? What if I lived here? What would my life look like if I did this instead? Because I always want to make the best decisions and have the best outcomes for the best life. And this really showed that although the grass may seem greener in other situations, there's ups and downs to everything. And I just love the way it was explored. I know it sounds super deep but it did really make me look at my own life differently and I feel like it eased a lot of my anxieties about making decisions because I know it's going to be fine no matter what decision I make there's going to be good and bad in everything and every situation. I was really satisfied in this book too because there were a bunch of different scenarios that I wanted to see and different lives I wanted to read about Nora trying out and I feel like we got that in this book. We got to see all the different lives I wanted to see play out for Nora and how they would have been so I was really satisfied. I think my only critique of this book is that I wasn't completely connected to our main character. I feel like for as much as I could relate to her situation in the beginning, while she was going through the different lives, I didn't feel super emotionally attached and connected and invested in her story. I didn't feel like I was walking in her shoes and feeling things along with her. And I felt like there could have been a little more character development. But other than that, I thought this one was great. I loved the themes. I loved the message and I would highly recommend it. Then I ended up reading Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross on my Kindle. I'm sure you've heard and seen the hype for this one because I saw it everywhere. I feel like this was on everyone's favorite books of the year list last year and so I just had really sky high expectations going into this one and I was so excited to read it. This book I guess you would call it historical fantasy with romance in it. It's set I believe in the late 1800s and there is a war going on between gods and goddesses. We're following our two main characters Iris and Roman who work for the same newspaper company and they're both up for the same promotion so they are workplace rivals. They end up both being able to communicate to one another through these magical typewriters and you kind of follow their romance. There is a little mystery element because Iris doesn't know who she's sending her letters to and I did give this one a good rating. I gave it four stars but I was a bit disappointed by it just because I thought it would be an easy five star for me at the lowest four and a half star. There were things I liked about it and things I didn't. I think at the start it was very hard for me to get into and it was just very slow going. I thought the writing was beautiful but I did think it was kind of lacking in descriptions. I kind of just wanted to know more about the world, what was going on, and the setting. But then around like the 35-40% mark when the romance picked up, I felt like the story got a lot better and I was more interested and their relationship was just so sweet and endearing to me and I was loving the middle section of the book. I also thought the way the story kind of was structured and transitioned to a different setting and different things going on was done really nicely. But then the last 30% of the book slowed back down for me. I feel like I was kind of forcing myself to keep reading. I was only motivated by the fact that everyone says the ending of this book is just crazy. I had predictions for what I thought the ending would be. I kind of knew what was going to happen. I just didn't know how it was going to come about. And I was a bit disappointed by the ending. I didn't think it was super crazy. I didn't think it was the biggest cliffhanger ever. But I think that just kind of showed me that I wasn't super invested in the characters and I wasn't dying to jump into the second book in this duology, Ruthless Vows. I'll definitely pick it up at some point, but I'm not in a rush to read it. And I feel like I'm coming off as negative and like I didn't like it. I definitely did. I thought the story was really strong and I did really love moments of the romance and the two main characters, but I think my expectations were just so high and they weren't met. But overall, I did enjoy this one. And then I read Daisy Hates by Jessa Hastings. This is book two in the Magnolia Parks universe. If you're unfamiliar with this series, basically we're following this group of socialites in high society London. The way the series is structured is it alternates who the focus is on. So book one is following this really toxic relationship between this couple Magnolia Parks and BJ Ballantyne and then book two is about Daisy Hates and her family and what they're involved in and her love interest as well and the books alternate who the focus is on from there. This book follows the same timeline of events as book one Magnolia Parks did but it 
it doesn't feel repetitive at all because the Hayes family and Daisy, they're very much involved in their own things. There's definitely overlap because within their friend group, there's like mutual friends that are in Magnolia and BJ's friend group. And you'll see some of the same scenes, but from these characters point of view and you get to look at things in a totally different way. And I loved that about it. So it never felt repetitive. It felt like its own story. And I absolutely loved this book. I gave it five stars. I rated Magnolia Park's book very highly. I gave that book 4.75 stars. I felt like something was missing just a little bit. And I feel like this book gave me what I was missing. I've heard people say that you're either a Magnolia person or a Daisy person. You kind of prefer one person's books over the other. And I definitely think that's the case with me. I just really connected to and loved Daisy's character. I would say that all the characters in these books are frustrating and a bit unlikable. But I feel like as far as Daisy's character goes, I could really empathize with her more based on where she's been. The way she makes decisions, she's just very smart and she kind of thinks things through more logically. And I feel like she's just a very self-assured and confident character and I really enjoyed reading about her. Whereas I think Magnolia's character was a bit more immature and childish and kind of made decisions out of spite. So I really do prefer Daisy's books and her character, but I love this world and I love all these characters so much. The way Jessa writes these books these characters don't feel fictional and the things they're going through feel so real. I'm super invested and just obsessed with this series now and I cannot wait to continue on with the rest of the books. And then I kind of unexpectedly ended up listening to the audio of Yellow Face by RF Kuang. Our main character in this book is a writer named June and one night she is hanging out at a fellow writer's house named Athena and Athena that night when they're hanging out tragically dies but before she dies earlier in the night Athena shows June this manuscript that she was working on for her next book and June ends up taking this manuscript after Athena dies and steals Athena's work. The main problem with this aside from the fact that June stole Athena's work is that June is a white woman and Athena is Asian and this book is about Chinese slave laborers in World War One. So there's a lot of commentary in this book on who can tell what stories, a lot of commentary on the publishing industry and I absolutely loved this book. I gave it 4.75 stars. I was not expecting to love this book as much as I did. I thought it was so enthralling. It was like the least predictable book I ever read. I was on my toes the whole time. I had no clue where things were going or how things were going to play out. I feel like one situation in the book would happen and that scenario would be over. I'm like, okay, now what? I have no clue where this is going and it would just take so many turns and I was so engaged the whole time. I was so invested and it was just so enthralling. I was obsessed with it. I think the only reason it's not a five star is because RF Kuang's books are very theme driven. She's always trying to send across a message and there's a lot of commentary in her books which is great and really well done but for me I think I need a strong character connection to give a book five stars and I didn't really feel that in this book so I don't think I'm gonna think back on it all the time but in the moment it was one of the most enthralling things I've ever read. It was so good. RF Kuang is just so smart and that really shines through in her writing. I learned so much about the publishing industry reading this. I just think she can do no wrong and I love that she kind of branched out of her comfort zone and wrote something that was more on the thriller literary fiction side. It was just such a fun time and so good. I would highly recommend it. I also ended up picking up the audio for The Last Word by Taylor Adams. This one follows a woman who is house sitting at this beach house in this like remote isolated setting. She passes a lot of her time by reading on her e-reader. She ends up reading this horror novel that she just thinks is so awful so when she finishes the book she ends up giving it a one-star review. The author of the book ends up responding to her one-star review and asks her to take it down and after she refuses really weird things start happening to her. She's like could this be the author coming after me and I gave this book three stars which I kind of was expecting based on how I felt towards Taylor Adams other book I read, No Exit, a few years ago. I picked that one up when I was very much in my thriller era because I saw everyone giving it five stars and I was a little bit disappointed by it. But I think for me it's more so just personal preference and me not really clicking with Taylor Adams' style of thrillers. His thrillers are more action focused and it's less mystery. You kind of find out the who and what early on. It's not really psychological. It's more so a story of like action and escaping and adventure and that's just not really my preference when I'm reading a thriller. I like to be kept on my toes a little bit more and I wasn't really on the edge of my seat in this one. And to be completely honest, I thought 
thought the first half of this book was so bad that I was like, wait, is this supposed to be bad on purpose so that I ironically give it a one star review? Because I just was not enjoying it. I think the way information was kind of given to us confused me because I was like, wait, are we supposed to know this person? Are we supposed to know what happened in this situation yet? Are we going to find out? But the second half did turn things around for me because it took some turns that I wasn't expecting and I thought it had a good ending. So I have mixed feelings on it. I was excited to read this one as someone who makes a lot of book content and reviews a lot of books. I think the premise and the concept of this was so interesting, but I didn't love the execution. And then the last book that I read in January is Indigo Ridge by Devaney Perry. This is the first book in the Eden series. And I feel like I see so much about this series but I never really fully understood what it was about. I would always kind of get more confused when I heard people talk about it. Basically, Indigo Ridge is set in the small town of Quincy, Montana, and our main female character is Winslow Covington. She is moving to this small town to take the job of police chief, and she faces a lot of adversity because she's young and a woman, so people kind of don't think she's capable of doing her job. She also gets mistreated by people in the town who have lived there their whole lives because she's kind of seen as like an outsider, but when when she first gets there, she ends up having a one night stand with this guy named Griffin who she thinks she's never gonna see again because she doesn't think he's a local. But as it turns out, Griffin is part of the Edens family who have very deep roots in Quincy, Montana, and they end up getting more entangled when a dead body is found on Griffin's ranch. So this story is both a cowboy romance and a mystery, and I thought both genres were done so well in this book, and I really enjoyed it. I gave this one four stars. There wasn't one part of the story that I was more invested in and the other. I was equally excited about the romance and the mystery aspect to it, and I was really caught off guard. I was not expecting things to go the way that they did. I really liked seeing the whole Eden family together. I'm assuming all six of the Eden siblings get their own books, and it made me very excited to continue on with this series. I really liked the small town setting and the cowboy romance vibes were giving me Chestnut Springs vibes. So I think if you like one, you'll definitely like the other. If you have read one and haven't read the other, it definitely reminded me of Chestnut Springs. And I thought it was really good and I can't wait to continue on with the Eden series this year. Those are the eight books I read in January. So that is going to conclude this reading wrap up. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to give this video a thumbs up and hit the red subscribe button down below to stick around to my channel if you're not already subscribed. Let me know what you guys read in January, what you loved, what you didn't love. Let me know if you read any of the books that I read in January and what your thoughts are on them. I would love to chat with you guys in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you so soon in my next video. Bye guys.